I arrived on 420 at a rental cabin two miles from downtown Leavenworth in Washington State. First night, I heard a wood knock, as we're going to be, about 10 p.m. Did not think much of it, rather than it being odd and startling me. Next evening, we were in the hot tub, about 8 p.m., still light outside. My husband heard two wood knocks. I discounted it, stating likely deer. About an hour later, he went out to our car and heard another knock. At this point, I started to think maybe it was a Bigfoot, but actually hoping not. I went to bed around 10 p.m. and shortly after, I got into bed, still wide awake and I heard a loud rock hitting the side of the wall behind my head. Then, heard another less loud rock sound hitting the wall of the bedroom next to me on the same wall. In the morning, I went out to see if I could find the rocks and believe I did. There are not that many rocks on the ground and the ones that were embedded into the ground. Two rocks were lying on top of the ground and did not appear that they had been there long in the weather. There was a bigger rock on my bedroom side and a smaller one on the other side. A follow-up investigation report was done by BFR investigator Jeff Sidebottom. Spoke with the witness and she seems very credible. Her husband was also a witness. April 20th, they arrived at the Bear Paul rental cabin near Leavenworth, Washington on April 20th. The weather was hot and clear. The cabin sits higher up on a hill than the ones around it. There are two hills in the back that form a V-shape down to the bottom behind the cabin. They went to bed around 10.30 p.m. The witness described hearing one loud distinct wood knock. April 21st. Weather was 70 degrees or so. Sunny. They were sitting in the hot tub and playing some jazz music a bit loud. And she heard two loud distinct wood knocks. She believes these were within 50 feet or so of the hills behind the cabin. They go to bed around 10 p.m. And around 10.30 p.m., a large rock hits the side of the bedroom wall. They were sleeping in separate rooms due to bad mattresses and a large rock hit the side of the cabin on her husband's bedroom wall. The husband claimed he could hear something rustling loudly in the woods behind the cabin. He looked and saw two deer come to the base of the V, made by the hills and then bolt back the way they came, as if spooked by something. That morning, the witness found a few rocks on top of the soil, while the others were embedded from sitting so long. Around 8.30 p.m., they were sitting inside and she had her back to the wall when a large rock hit the living room wall of the cabin. April 23rd. The weather was cloudy and a bit cooler now. The husband put apples out in different areas and did some wood knocks and tried some calls. They said no activity at all that day or night, other than seeing some wild turkey. April 24th. The weather was rainy and cloudy virtually no activity. April 25th. The deck was scuffed up near the hot tub, which sits next to a game trail. Part of the deck is wood, and part is treks. She said it looked similar to deer hooves, but deeper, and the ground was dry. There was a fresh gouge out the back deck. And there were claw marks everywhere. Some were thin and long, and she described them as four per print. The husband had heard some scuffling or something on the deck that night, but never looked to see what it might be. When you enter Kingman County, from east on 60th Street, our encounter was on the first bridge you come to. This creature was on the west bank, just north of the bridge. By the way, this happened May 17th of 2021 not even a month ago from this reporting. It was also pretty thickly wooded right there, but surrounded by farmland. I'm handicapped, so I can't walk to where he was, but my son could, but I didn't even think of it. It just happened a day before yesterday, and it's been raining at the time of writing this. A follow-up was done by BFRO investigator Matthew Moneymaker. I spoke with the witness, 
Patricia Parcel and her son Adrian. She is 65 and lives in Belmont, Kansas with her son. They have lived in Belmont for two years or so and lived in Kingsman before that. This brief setting occurred two days ago, 5-17-21, right around 6 p.m. Her son was driving her back home from a doctor's appointment in Wichita. She spotted the figure as they were crossing the bridge over the south fork of a river. They both saw the figure briefly, but she got a better look at it. She estimates it was 150 feet away from the bridge. He estimates 200. It was on the north side of the bridge and west of the river. It was across from the small island visible. The location of the intersection signs is half a mile west of the bridge. She and her son both say the water level is higher today than it was two days ago. More of the Sandy Creek Bank was visible then. The figure was standing on the riverbank, out from the tree line. It was only a few feet from the water. Right now, the spot where it was standing is completely underwater. She can not guess the height of the figure, but both witnesses say it was a reddish brown and distinct from the green tree line behind it. She is certain it was covered with fur, and she says she could definitely see its arms and hands. The hands were darker in color than the body fur. She had heard about two other BFRO reports on or near the same area river over the past 20 years, so she would look for Sasquatches whenever driving through here. She thought she had seen a similar figure in roughly the same spot previously, but did not get a good look at it while passing the bridge. This time, she got a better look at it. There was nothing like a stump or debris in the area. The county road crossing this river is the type of back road in Kansas, which may only see a few vehicles each day. Her son says that locals driving these roads do not drive faster than 50 because there are so many deer, it's unsafe to go any faster. This location seems like a prime spot to look for tracks, etc. It was dark at the time, and I was living on a road surrounded by woods. This was back in 2000, in the fall, in New Hampshire. I went out to take my dog for a walk. At the time, our driveway connected to a dirt road that ran up the side from the main road. We walked to the end of the dirt road, and along that road is a tree, lining of woods. As we began heading back, I looked over and noticed a tall figure staring at me just at the edge of the woods. I couldn't make out what it was, but it was definitely taller than seven feet, standing erect on two legs. I also noted that it had orange eyes. I started walking back down the road towards my house, and when I would stop, it would stop and look at me. I would walk some more. So would the thing. And then, once I stopped, it would stop. Now, I was really freaked out. So, I yelled for my dog to run, and we sprinted towards the house. That's when I finally got inside. I looked down our driveway, and across the road at the tree line. The figure was still there staring at me. I told my father, but when he looked, he saw nothing. It must have left by then. A follow-up investigation report was done by BFRO investigator Matthew Moneymaker. I spoke with the witness, Michelle Goodwin, by phone. She was a teenager at the time of this incident. She no longer lives in the house mentioned in the report. She says the area now has many more houses than back in 2000. Tanglewood Road has been extended as well. She said the figure was a silhouette but definitely not a bear. It was simply too tall and walked on two legs the entire time that it paralleled her. It was not more than five to six feet into the woods from side of the road. I asked about the eyes and whether they appeared to be glowing or just reflecting light. She said the eyes seemed to be glowing dimly, which is a common feature of many nighttime encounters. The color was somewhere between orange and yellow. Although she became more frightened as the stalking continued, 
She said the figure was not otherwise aggressive or hostile. She knew very little about the Sasquatch Bigfoot subject at the time. It was only many years later that she learned more and realized the figure that paralleled her in the night was likely one of these creatures by process of elimination. All right, here we go. I've had several encounters, so here's the first one. I was walking with two friends, looking for one of the friend's brother. Walking down the abandoned Lake Champlain and Moria Railroad track bed. It was approximately 1.30 a.m., June 25th, 1989. That's when we heard a god-awful screaming noise coming from over the bank on the south side of the old rail bed. Metal was being ripped and thrown. Over the bank, there were a series of junked-out cars, some Subarus and an early 60s Chevy station wagon. One of my friends uttered the obligatory, What was that? And the noises ceased, almost like it hurt us. The next thing we heard was the sound of something very large breaking through the heavy brush of the woods right below us. Before we knew it, it was up the bank and standing in front of us. In the dark, I could not see it, but I could tell that it was huge. There was a smell, as well, almost like crossing a dead skunk in a deep bog. Nasty. My buddies took off, leaving me, because I was slow to react. I mean, I was scared, but sort of curious. The thing, whatever it was, was right in front of me. I could feel its breath, hear it breathing. I was only there for a second or two and then started running. The thing took off after us. I could hear its feet on the gravel behind me. It stopped chasing us just as we broke out on the road and headed up the main street. I chanced to look back and I could see its shadow just inside the brush. I'll tell you this, whatever it was, it was big, a lot bigger than a man, and I have never seen a bear move like that. The bank it climbed was over a 45 degree angle, loose gravel and stone, covered with vines and heavy brush. We tried climbing it the next weekend, and it took the best of us over five minutes to climb. At the time, we never bothered to look for tracks. But one interesting note that I stated above is that there were junked cars on the south side of the rail bed, one of these being an early 60s station wagon, a big, heavy car. My friends and I had been in that area the week or so before, and the car had been on its wheels. The weekend after the occurrence, the car was on its roof, pieces ripped from it and scattered around. That really scared me and I haven't been back since. The second encounter I had, that was just as strange as the first. Me and a buddy of mine were cruising in his 85 LTD station wagon, as the ultimate touring vessel, as it were, just out of enjoying the late summer September weather. It was a beautiful September night, the 23rd, 1993. We drove up this four-wheel drive tail to the point where everybody parties, Every hick town is one, and the trail heads for Westport, New York. He wheeled the car around and parked with the rear facing the woods, the nose facing down the road that we just came in on. We were just talking about the town, friends, plans, just stuff. I happened to look out the back, and I could see something coming up behind the car. The LTD wagon had huge taillights, and there was no guard over the license plate light, so the back of the car lit the area up pretty nicely. This thing was big, black, and had its arm out like it was going to open the door on the driver's side. The part that scared me the most was the fact that the rear hatch of the wagon did not latch. It kind of just moved around, thumped and when you hit a bump, that sort of thing. It was one of those things Matt was always going to fix, but... You know how us men are. Never did. Anyway, I looked at Matt and asked, Did you lock the doors? 
calmly, almost deadpan. Something's about to open the door. Matt slammed the gear shift into drive and we took off out of there. I looked back and the thing stood up. It easily had to be over seven feet tall. I mean, we're talking huge. Its eyes must have caught the taillight's glow because there was a red flicker in them. We never stopped until we got down to Port Henry, which is about six or seven miles away. I live in a rural part of New York, just outside the blue line. I know what bears look like. I know how they behave. Each one of these encounters was no bear. I still don't know what to call each of them. It seems to fit the Sasquatch theory. But why in the middle of nowhere? Where I live, they already had the tourist hook. Lake Champlain. Each year, people with out-of-state plates flood the little town looking for the elusive critter. It's been almost 10 years since my first encounter and a scant five since my last. I'll tell you what, though. I still have no idea what exactly chased out of the woods we played in. The first encounter, though, we just had left Richie's house, went out looking for his brother. We were looking for his brother because he had gotten in a fight. He had arrived home just after we went out looking for him, though. We were also all very sober. For the second encounter, Matt and I were driving around, just cruising, looking for something, anything to do. Sober again at that point, as I want to make mention, I don't drink or do drugs. In August of 1996, myself and six friends were camping at Pine Pond in the Lower Saranac Lake region. It was around dusk, and my friend and I were fishing in our canoe. The other members of our party were at camp preparing supper, about a quarter mile away through the forest from our location on the canoe in the middle of the lake. My friend and I were speaking openly, not attempting to be quiet in any way. I was skinning the northern bank of the lake, which I knew quite well. That's when I noticed a strange shape on the edge of the wood line. It was about 50 yards away. Immediately, I pointed it out to my friend and he spotted it instantly. The shape was three and a half feet off the ground at its highest point. At first, we both thought it was a black bear standing broadside, but after a few seconds, I realized that was not the case. We started to row towards it somewhat cautiously. Just as my friend whispered, It's a bear. The thing stood up. It had been crouching there on its feet, like a catcher from a baseball team. This thing, what we thought was a bear, had to have easily been seven feet tall and was very dark brown in color. Its face was hairy, yet fleshy around the upper cheeks. Its eyes were both dark in color, but clearly visible and had a brightness about them. Upon talking afterwards, we both agreed that what we saw, the movements of its head and hands, it stood there for what seemed like 10 seconds looking at us. It tilted its head slightly, as if it were sniffing the air, as if this all wasn't strange enough. We then heard the snapping twigs, about 50 feet behind it. The creature turned its torso to the left, looked to its side. Then, it immediately turned back towards us, then spun 180 degrees around, darting into the woods like a cat. We heard the sound of movement for about 10 more seconds. Lastly, nothing. To this day, I'm unsure what made those noises. After staying put in the canoe for about 10 minutes, my friend decided, against my wishes, to paddle to the spot on shore and investigate for tracks. There were only two discernible markings in the sand, which were obscured from pivoting its feet when it turned around. The whole experience was very, very upsetting. Although, I can honestly say it did not attempt to threaten us in any way. It was scary. That night, I did not sleep one week. I was so focused on every little noise that I heard. And the next day, we left. The other people in our party are convinced we saw a bear. But I'm telling you, it was no bear. A follow-up investigation report was done by BFRO investigator, Paul Mateja. 
The witness and her friend were in a canoe fishing when they saw a dark object approximately 50 yards away along the north, northwest shoreline of Pine Pond. They thought it was a bear and began to row towards it. When they had closed the distance to about 40 feet, this creature stood up. Immediately realizing this was not a bear, they stopped rowing and paddled backwards. They observed it for about 25 more seconds. However, details of the creature's appearance were rather vague because it was standing in the shadows and light levels were low at that point in the day. The report states it was about 7 feet tall, but in retrospect, the witness believes it was a little less than that. It was very similar in size and moved in a fashion similar to the creature seen in the Patterson film. The witness is not sure what was making the noise behind the creature. It did not seem alarmed at all by the noise, but rather seemed to know what it was, and it was at this point it turned and left. Pine Pond is about 10 miles from Lake Placid, host of 1932 and 1980 Winter Olympic Games. I didn't have an encounter exactly, but we are the owners of a camp in a remote region of the Adirondack Mountains. The camp is only accessible by hiking to it. There rarely is ever anybody around our camp. We have found strange things that have occurred. The first, in fall of 2002, we went hiking for the day when we get back and we found a small pile of rocks at the back door. They were neatly stacked with a stick coming out of them. These rocks were not there when we left. They appeared to be deliberately stacked. We understand that these could not have been easily made by a human, but there's never anybody around up there. The fall of 2003. One night, around 7.30 p.m., dark, my wife and I went outside with two dogs. We smelled something very strong and musty like nothing we smelled before. It wasn't the dogs or anything we could remotely identify. The two dogs got very antsy and begged to go inside right away. This was very strange and freaky. Now, these dogs are generally not scared dogs. They also are large dogs, about 80 pounds each. We had never seen them act this way, ever. When we bring them out at night or day, they run all over the woods and this night, they wanted nothing to do with that. Almost like they smelt something that scared them. Number three. The same exact thing happened. I went outside around 9.30 p.m. to relieve myself. While I was doing that, I hear a large, heavy stomping behind me. The stomping was loud and heavy, as if something was fleeing. But the strange part is it sounded like it made four to five bounds, then stopping. I heard nothing else after that. I looked around a little bit, but the happenings of this night made me uneasy. So I went inside and locked up the cabin. I don't know what did all this, and maybe it's easily explained away, but these things altogether make me think it might have been a Bigfoot. A follow-up investigation report was done. I spoke with the witness by phone on 12-22-05. The witness recounted the set of unusual occurrences in amazing detail. The remote cabin where the events took place has been in the family for over 70 years, and the witness's family typically stays there for a weekend or two, at least once every fall. The cabin has no running water or electricity and requires a half-mile hike from the nearest road. Now, the first event took place in the late afternoon when the witness, his wife, and two young children and three adult relatives returned to the cabin after a day-long hike in the adjacent area. Nothing unusual took place during the hike, but upon returning to the cabin, the group observed a small rock pile and stick formation on the back porch steps. There were a total of three rocks, which the witness described as being relatively flat and smooth and about the size of an adult hand. He reported that similar stones are found in abundance and scattered all throughout the immediate cabin area. No other events took place the remainder of the weekend. 
approximately one year later, the family of four and two adult relatives was at the cabin for yet another October weekend retreat. In the early evening, the witness and his wife went out to the back porch of the cabin with their two family dogs. They both immediately smelt an unusual, strong, musky odor that the very witness described as a wet dog smell. They smelt their dogs and ruled out the odor as coming from them. Nothing further happened, and the couple decided to play it safe by going back inside after a few moments. Now, approximately two hours go by, and the witness went out the front door of the cabin, walked about 25 feet to the edge of the tree line. While standing there, the witness heard a very loud stomping sound, but it only lasted for a few seconds, but it shook the ground around him. The witness turned toward the sound, which he estimated to be coming from the base of a hillside, about 25 yards away. As soon as the witness turned, the sound ceased. The witness mentioned that although it was a windy night, the sound did not seem to be a falling tree branch. No vocalizations or strange smells were observed in that moment. No further events have taken place for the remainder of the family's stay. The witness mentioned seeing tree scrappings in an area about six feet off the ground and that bear and deer are known to inhabit the area. The witness also mentioned an abundance of wild blueberry and blackberry bushes in the area that bear fruit in August and September. The witness and his immediate family have not been back to the cabin since 2003. These occurrences took place near Keene Valley, New York, within the Adirondack Park Reserve. The cabin is actually located near the Phelps Brook High Wilderness Area, a recognized ancient forest area with a top elevation of 3,700 feet, comprised of basalm fir, red spruce, and mountain paper birch. Also nearby is the Marcy Swamp, also an ancient forest area. Vocalizations and sightings have been previously reported in the entire general area, central Essex County. On June 10th, 2006, I was driving with my brother on a back road, unpaved in the Adirondack Park. We were heading for a trailhead that led into the Hudson River Gorge. This area is almost dead center in the park and surrounded by many miles of uninhabited and very rugged terrain. It was late morning on a clear day. I was driving as fast as I could on this road because we had to get back to town by a certain time. As we turned a bend, I see a very large brown free object lunging into the dense woods up the road at the next curve, maybe 50 yards ahead. It was obvious that the creature was in the road and was startled by my speeding SUV. I told my brother, Hey, there goes a moose. We reached the spot in about three seconds and I slam on my brakes, expecting to see the moose right there in the bushes. At that spot though, through the bushes, was a decent sized clearing and then more dark woods that went down a hill. As we looked, there was nothing at all. Everything was still. We started off again and took our hike. The more I thought about it though, the more I thought it couldn't have just been a moose. First of all, it was the wrong color. A light chestnut brown. The color was very visible because the sun was shining in the area. It was a striking shade against the light green of the brush. And moose are never that shade. They are always a dark brown. Second, the size and shape are wrong. This thing was huge, at least seven feet tall, and the shape was not like a moose rump. The more I thought about it, the more it seemed like it was the upper back and head of something. Finally, if it was a moose, it would have not utterly vanished so quickly. My vehicle got to that spot in just seconds. Moose at least the ones that I have seen don't tear off into the woods. We should have seen it in the clearing. It wasn't a bear either, not even close. I wished I had stopped to investigate further. Unfortunately, we were in a hurry. 
and did I mention this location is in the middle of a large wilderness? There are practically no roads or trails at all in the entire area. In fact, some sections of the forest here are completely impassable due to very steep overgrown terrain. A follow-up investigation report was done by BFRO investigator Paul Conroy. After an extensive phone interview, the witness provided the following details. The sighting lasted approximately three seconds, using the trees at the location that the creature stood as base. The witness estimated the animal at seven and a half feet tall and having a color described as chestnut or light brown. As this thing moved away, the witness observed the shoulders and head of the animal. The witness owns a house in the area and is very familiar with native wildlife. The color description and details provided by the witness regarding how the creature moved seems to rule out a bear. While there are moose in the area, they generally do not move in the smooth and quick manner that was described. When they are disturbed by human activity, they commonly walk away slowly. This area is also in the vicinity of the Hudson River Gorge, a part of the Adirondack Mountains, known for clean, fast-moving water sources, abundant wildlife, and dense forest and vegetation with a lot of small cliffs and peaks. This is my Bigfoot sighting. This was in early August of 2010, approximately around 8 to 8.30 a.m., right on the Cascade Lakes, New York, near Keene, and the weather was clear, with only a few clouds. I spend most of the summers camping in and around the Adirondacks in my Dodge Caravan. In this particular summer, I had stopped at Cascade Lake to spend a few days camping. I had slept soundly the previous night and had woken up around 7 a.m. I decided to get up and start making my breakfast. I had just started the kettle on the camp stove when I looked over at the upper Cascade Lake and I could see the mist rising off the surface of the lake. I grabbed my iPhone and walked about 50 yards to the edge of the lake to get a picture. As I approached the break wall, that's when I noticed a dark brown object on the opposite side of the lake at the shoreline. At first, I couldn't make out what it was, but it seemed to be sitting at the water's edge. I then quickly realized it must have been a bear. The animal looked like it was doing something in the water with its paws, as I could hear a faint splashing sound. I thought it would be a good idea to get a picture, so I brought my iPhone up to my face level, tried to focus in on the animal. As I was focusing in, the animal stood up on two legs. I was startled and pulled down my phone to see this with my own eyes. It took a step towards the tree line and stopped, almost methodically. As it stopped, it turned its entire upper body to the left, staring at me for a couple of seconds. It turned back and in one step, disappeared into the tree line. I immediately went cold and got scared. As I ran back to my campsite, my only thought was that it was going to go left or right. If it went right, it would have to go into the water, and if it went left, it was headed directly for my campsite. I decided that it was best to get the hell out of Dodge. I arrived back at my campsite in just under a minute. My dog was still asleep on the front seat and did not even stir. I opened the passenger side door of my van and, and began to throw all my camping gear into the back of the van, making quite a mess. I closed the door, jumped into the driver's side, and floored the gas to leave. As I'm driving out, I kept looking at my left driver's side window to see if I can observe any possibility of seeing it, but I saw nothing. I drove all the way into Lake Placid, parked at a mall parking lot to try and gather my thoughts and think about what had taken place. It's easy to say that I was shaken up and I kept replaying that experience over and over in my head, just trying to understand and make sense of what I had seen. Here are my observations. I could not ascertain its height exactly due to the distance, but I would guess that it was approximately seven to eight feet tall, covered head to toe in shaggy dark brown hair 
or fur. I could see the sunlight shining off its back as it turned to go into the tree line and could see the brown coloration as it turned away from me. When it turned to stare at me, I could not make out any facial features, but I knew that it saw me. The upper body was massive and stocky like a football player's build was. It had very long arms and went well below its waist. I could also make out what I assume were the shape of hands. It walked upright and paused before slowly turning its upper body to look directly at me. It stared at me for approximately 5 to 10 seconds and turned back to face the tree line. It took about one or two more steps, then finally disappearing into the forest. I could see a couple of branches move after it went into the trees. It was then I decided to leave. I did not hear anything other than the initial splashing it made in the water with its hands when I first thought it was a bear. I did not return to the area until three years later with a friend at camp. Nothing has happened on subsequent trips to the area of Cascade Lake. I have had two other odd experiences in other areas of the 80Ks on other trips though. The past several months, we have had some very strange activity going on around our house. We live out in the country and we've ignored a lot of it. But here lately, we can't ignore the activity going on. About a month or two ago, my husband went outside to smoke and he heard something and as he looked in our driveway, he seen an animal that stood about seven feet tall, all hairy. He couldn't explain it, except that it looked like one of our dogs on two feet and extremely tall. It walked past our trailer, and that's how he could guess that the height could be. We've heard what sounded like a baseball bat hitting a tree. We've heard whistles and calls of what Bigfoot sounds like. We've had chickens and cats go missing. Every night, about the same time, you can hear footsteps and sounds. It's to the point to where we are scared to go outside. We've never believed in Bigfoot till we've seen it and have heard them. I'm sure there are more than one around because we live near caves. They sound like they are all around us at night. We had a ball in our yard and after finding it in the woods one day and down the road from us another day and bring it back several times, it went missing and we've not been able to find it since. I just find it odd that this has just happened after we've been hearing noises that sounded like Bigfoot. We were camped along Marble Creek at Donkey Creek near Avery, Idaho, July 2019. It was a weekday, so no other campers were within miles. Deep mountain valleys and dense woods. I was chopping food for dinner. My husband and small children were fishing at the Loud Creek. I'm an avid birder, obsessed. I must know every call I hear. And that evening, I heard a call that sounded like an old-fashioned crank police siren. It was echoing through the valley and came from a higher altitude. Howls of the same timbre and pitch, but slightly varying length. I thought it was an owl. I must not know. Wolves and cougar don't sound like that. My dog did not bark. She hid under the table. I also considered that maybe some kids were playing with an old police siren. But then I realized there was no way kids could have been up there near the ridge with something that heavy. Plus, no one else was up there. When I got back into cell reception, I searched through owl calls and found nothing similar. But I found that call on other Bigfoot websites. It was the Ohio Howl. I live in Wisconsin and have been interested in Sasquatch my entire life. I have been a hunter for 44 years and know sounds, footprints, and behavior of just about every creature in Wisconsin. I have always wanted to become involved in actively looking for Sasquatch. In 2015, I started researching sightings and incidents in Wisconsin and discovered the northern third of the state had many reports in Phillips, Prentice, and Price counties as well as the national forests. My husband is also interested, so we decided to research areas of some reported sightings. We spent a great deal of time walking around the forest off of Highway 17 near Winter, Wisconsin. 
we documented our findings using video cams and photographs. I have a photo of what I believe is a Sasquatch print in the forest near some tree bends and a small ground glyph that was about five yards from the print. A year later, we discovered that the glyph had been modified with additional sticks and limbs. We have photographs of tree bends and breaks and trees woven together that no human could manage, and since 2015, have actively returned to the same area of the forest to see if there are no changes or anything new. I have also had a response to a wood knock that I did in the summer of 2018. The area of the return knock is in the area that has no homes, roads, or trails. Beginning in 2016, my oldest sister, my daughter and I decided to set up camp near Loretta, and each summer we would spend time camped and actively researching and have many photographs. On June 6th through 9th, 2019, we once again set up our camp in the same campground, but in a different site that we had not used before. At the end of the row, on the southwest side of the camp, there is nothing for miles behind that spot. We did not see anything unusual when we hiked through the forest earlier in the day, but on our last night, a bear walked through our campsite just before dark so we decided to hit the bunks early. It was around 10 to 10.30 p.m. when I heard a rustling around the camper. It's a modified camper with a deck that has a zipper tent extending from the camper with a tarp material around the bottom. The creature was crinkling and fiddling around with the bottom portion of the extended porch and making the tarp crackle. I thought the bear had returned and was rustling around camp and expected the camp to be destroyed and the next morning. The noise went on for about a half an hour and then it stopped. My daughter and sister were asleep. Less than 30 minutes later, a handful of rocks hit the side of the camper, followed by three more rounds of rocks. And finally, a larger rock hit the camper roof. This woke my sister, who sleeps with earplugs. She later says she does not know why she woke up, but I believe it was the sound of the big rock hitting above her head. By then, my daughter was awake as well. It was quiet the rest of the night. The next morning when it was light out, I bailed out of the camper, expecting to see a ripped up camp, but all was pristine. The first morning at camp, my daughter set up a hammock behind and slightly to the side of the back of the camper. When she was taking it down, she found a rock in the hammock. My theory is that whatever threw rocks had to lob them over her hammock, and one either bounced back and fell into the hammock or pinged off the tree and landed in the hammock. We were the only campers in the campground, except for a man that came in with his rig. He left the next morning. Many areas have tree bends, twists, a possible footprint, all in the forest just east and north of the campground where the rock throwing incident occurred. I was with a friend of mine behind his grandmother's house. We had seen some dead fish near a pond, broke in half, so we went back later that day to look, to see what might have caused it. We went about 100 yards in the woods, when my friend had to go use the bathroom, so he walked away from me, when I heard a noise off to my right. I looked, and see something looking around a tree, about 50 to 75 yards away. I could make out on fur of the outline of the shape. It looked like it was about 8 feet tall. I seen it take a step and then I took off running back to the house. I was the only one that seen it. He just noticed me running back to the house. He was using the bathroom. I was having a small campfire last night alone with my small dog, who at the time was sleeping. First, there was something moving through the wooded area to my left. Sounded like it was on two feet and moving towards some neighbor's houses. I wasn't alarmed by this, Although it was dark and there were no flashlight, the neighbors do walk through there from time to time. My dog was not alerted at all. This part of the incident may just be coincidental, but it's what happened next that I'm curious about. About five to 10 minutes later, to the left of me, way off in the distance, there was an obvious wood knock, then immediately to the right of me in the distance, but in the direction is the Great Croton Swamp, was reply wood knock and then immediately after that, another from the left, then nothing. I've never heard anything like that before. 
It was about 11 p.m., and the neighborhood was quiet, and in my opinion, it was an obvious call and response. Are wood knocks usually so instantaneous, or do they usually have some time in between? Me and two friends were walking up to the gas pipeline to fish a natural spring on the mountain, now privately owned by a hunting and fishing club. As we crested our first hill, all three of us stopped at the same time. We saw a Bigfoot about 200 feet up the pipeline. I would estimate it to be about seven feet tall, brown and very shaggy. After about 30 seconds, it ran into the wood line. It covered about 30 feet in three strides and disappeared. As we got to where it was, you could see four spots where the tall grass was pushed down from its steps. My friend says Bigfoot threw rocks at him in the 70s, about five miles away. I live in Greenville, Texas, north of town, just off of Highway 69 North. I have lived here 12 years and have had strange things going on at my house since I moved here. But in the last two to three years, things have really started happening more. I live down a dirt road off of Highway 69. There are a lot of woods around me. Also have several neighbors around me too. And in late summer of 2017, I was jolted awake in the middle of the night by a loud banging on my house. I knew I wasn't dreaming because I shot straight up. And at that exact moment, my two little dogs flew off my bed barking and carrying on. I stumbled into the kitchen, wondering what could be happening, and it was 2.38 a.m. My two big dogs outside were not barking, which I thought was odd. To make a long story short, I called the sheriff's department. Two deputies came out and found nothing. From that moment on, Every two or three months, I have several incidents for a week or two, then nothing for another month or two or three. Then things will happen again. This past winter, from November 2019 to February 2020, I've had several things happen. On three separate occasions, while I've been propped in bed watching TV, I have heard a loud growl outside my bedroom, loud enough to hear over the TV. It was loud and guttural. I have had tapping on the back of my house during the night. It's usually always around the same time of night. In January of 2020, I was once again propped up in my bed watching TV. And over my TV, I heard something rubbing on the back of my house, on the wall where my bathroom is. My bedroom and bathroom run together. My two little dogs jumped off the bed into the bathroom at the back wall barking. I've had rocks thrown at my house. I'm home alone most of the time, but this past Saturday night, April 18th, 2020, my husband happened to be home. Between 11 p.m. and 11.30 p.m., my dog starts barking and wouldn't stop, so I get up to holler as to her to hush. As I got to my bedroom door, my cat was lying in my rocking chair next to my door. I paused to pet her, and about that time, I heard that same loud guttural growl at my back door. My cat heard it wheeled around and looked at the back door. I went and woke up my husband. He looked out at the back and saw nothing. I went to the front door and opened it and he called my dog. She would not get close to the fence and was barking, looking towards the back of my house, towards my neighbor's home behind me. All of a sudden, she jumped back, like whatever it was was coming towards her. I ran to my guest room to look out the window facing that direction and back towards northwest. I saw something huge and dark in color going across my neighbor's back pasture, moving fast. My neighbor behind me lives alone, and she has had the same things happen at her house. On October 7th, 2017, my wife, myself, and our dog went on a late season kayak paddle to Upper Priest Lake and overnight camping trip at Beaver Creek Campground. After loading the kayak after our paddle, we drove half a mile to the campground, only to find that it was closed for the season. Not wanting to find another campsite, we drove around the campground to Tool Bay Boat Launch parking area, which was still open. We parked our vehicle, unloaded our tent, sleeping and cooking gear, and began to set up camp, carrying things into a designated site that would normally be accessed by the campground road. I was a bit concerned about camping in the site, 
after the campground was officially closed, but figured that it was already getting dark. It was unlikely that we would be confronted by a ranger. It had been raining and was getting cold, and my wife wanted a campfire to warm up our paddle to Upper Priest Lake. I didn't want to start a fire, as I was still uneasy about camping there and concerned that a fire would attract attention to us. After setting up the tent and getting things situated, we heard a who call to the north of us across the road. I had the distinct impression that it wasn't an owl, but a person wooing for somebody in the dark woods, like someone trying to contact a hiker who was late getting back to the car, though there were no other cars in the area. The call was quite loud, louder than any owl I have ever heard. To me, it seemed like it was coming from something, a person with very large lung capacity. By this time, it was dark, and we couldn't see anything beneath the tree canopy outside of our campsite. While my wife worked on starting a fire with wet branches, unsuccessfully, I arranged our sleeping gear in the tent. Suddenly, we heard a woo call that was much closer and much louder. This call made us nervous, as we both felt it was made by a person who was camping around our campsite in the dark, messing with us. But we had heard no vehicles drive in, saw no headlights or flashlights, and it was too dark and overcast for a person to drive or walk around the woods without a light. My wife has better hearing than I do, and heard what she felt was an answering who from some distance away in the forest. Grabbing a flashlight, I walked 75 feet or so back to our vehicle to get my 9mm pistol. There was no question that this was not an owl. The call was much too loud and gave both of us a fearful feeling. I could feel the loudness of the call in my chest. We noticed that our dog had no reaction to the calls, remaining in camp and not acting scared, but I sure felt that way, even with a firearm on my hip. After the last loud call, we didn't hear anything more the rest of the night. No vehicles drove into the boat launch parking area and we heard no people or animals about. In the morning, I looked around our campsite, but couldn't see that anything had been disturbed. Later back home, my wife researched owl calls online, but couldn't find anything that sounded like what we had heard. Whatever had made those calls around our campsite that night knew we were there and had a lung capacity much larger than an adult human male. Last fall, 2019, while on a motorcycle ride up Tango Creek, which was approximately 15 miles from our incident, we saw a fir tree, about five feet in diameter, broken off about the eight to nine foot tall off the ground, near a trail by a pull-out parking area. No other trees in the area had been damaged. It was last year, 2019, around mid-October, near the Blue Ridge Parkway. Me and my boyfriend were working for the Roanoke Times delivering newspaper when this encounter happened. We delivered anywhere from 12 a.m. to 6 a.m. We were almost done with the route when we went to turn down this dead end maintenance road since there was houses at the end of that who got paper. It was around 3.30 to 4 a.m. While my boyfriend was going down the gravel and maintenance road, the headlights caught a glimpse of this thing standing right at where the grass met the road. It stood about seven feet tall and it took off up the hill. It kind of walked fast, not necessarily ran. It was dark brown and had shaggy hair like fur. It was on two feet and walked like a human with its arms swaying back and forth, right below the knees. I screamed out for my boyfriend to stop the car, but by the time his reaction time kicked in, whatever it was already made its way up the hill. My boyfriend positioned the car so the lights would shine up the hill and that's when we saw two bright glowing red yellow eyes looking back at us. What was strange when it was hiding behind a huge tree and how high the eyes were up from the ground. It was close to seven feet tall. You could clearly see the eyes blink. We sat there for approximately 10 minutes and finally decided to finish up the route and come back. We did eventually come back after we got done with the last house and it was gone but you could see where the tree limbs and grass was pushed down from where it was standing on the side of the road. Maybe less than a month before we had the encounter, we had heard tree knocks while on our route from deep down in the woods, maybe a neighborhood or two over. 
It scared us so bad when we heard it that we just bagged the newspaper up and threw it on the side of the road. It was around the year 1989. I was working at McDonald's in Carlinville, and I was closed that night. I was headed home around 1 a.m. or 2 a.m. I was headed west on Illinois Highway 108. I was going through an area on the highway known to the locals as Hagaman Bottoms. Just as I was about to approach the bridge at the bottom of Bell Hill, I saw a large creature standing next to the road. Just as I got near it, or just about even with the creature, it reached out at my car. It scared me, and I accelerated my car to get away from it. It was very bright, moonlit night, and I could tell that it was dark brown, or black in color. It was also tall, as it stood above the top of my car. The car I owned at the time was a Chevy Celebrity Eurosport. I remember it standing facing east when I was passing it. It turned south and reached out with its right hand. This was a very scary experience for a young girl in a car going home all by herself. As a child, I grew up in a small town named Fayette. This town is just west of Hagaman Bottoms. At night after the supper meal, we would take food scraps out to the trash burning barrel behind the shed. I would get a feeling like there was always something around or close by, and my hair would stand up on my arms, and I would get very scared to go out there when it was dark. I never did see anything, but just got an eerie feeling like something was watching me. I have had two incidents in the last few months. The first happened one morning when I woke up early and had to use the restroom. On the way back to bed, I looked out the back door to see the sunrise and check if the dog was in the backyard. I watched a large dark person or thing cross the field from one tree line to another. The second happened on the night of the meteor shower just a few weeks ago. I walked outside to look up and watch the shower. I stood there for several minutes before I looked down. Directly on the other side of the fence was a large form. After I screamed my head off, it bolted to the tree line. It may be completely unrelated, but our dogs have been bringing home several bones from different animals on a semi-weekly basis. I have had several experiences over the years near my home. Five years ago, I was picking blackberries on the back side of my property late June. To the east of the blackberry vines is a farm field. The field was planted in corn, and there was a strip of last year's corn residue at the edge of the field. Old stubble, hard to walk through with boots on. There were a series of footprints coming out of the field, moving towards the woods. There were five prints, about my size, men's 11 or 12, barefoot, wide with no arch, flat-footed. I go barefoot a lot, but no one in their right mind walks through a cornfield with stubble and barefoot. Four years ago, my son and I were in my bedroom, watching videos on my computer, about six in the evening, when something passed by my cabin and beat on the wall as it went by. Scared us to death, the pounding started near the corner of the room where we were in, near the ceiling. This is a good 10 feet above the ground level outside. The second was in the other corner of the room. The third hit sounded like it came from above the window in the den, and the fourth and fifth hits were on the bathroom wall. Quick, bam, 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 bam. I live in a log cabin, and it literally shook the house. Next morning, I looked around outside. No prints, nothing on the logs. It was in July and August. Ground was dry and hard. I have ruled the house settling, small animals, birds. No idea what it was. This year, May to June 2012, about 10.30 at night, I was getting ready for bed. My son was in the bathroom. We both heard a low, very guttural grunt. Who? Outside the house. My son is 18, and large, muscular young man, but he came out of the bathroom, pulling up his jeans and looking scared. We ran out onto the porch in time to see something large, dark, and low to the ground run past my neighbor's house. Truthfully, it looked like a gorilla, running flat on all fours. It activated my neighbor's motion sensor lights in front of his home, 
and about 30 seconds later, the coyotes on the other side of the highway went nuts. It was moving, quarter of a mile in just under a minute. The next day, my father said he also heard the grunt. It woke him up. I sometimes find broken trees and bent trees in the woods. I have also heard screams and howls that I can't just write off as being a deer, bobcat, coyote, or vixen. Whenever my husband works midnights, I can't sleep, so I came outside to sit on my steps and smoke a cigarette. I happened to look up because the dogs were barking at something. I looked up and saw this tall black figure standing and kind of peeking out from behind the shed. I looked at it and kind of squinted at it to see what I could see, and it really wasn't moving. I went back inside my house and grabbed the gun. When I came back out, it was gone. I don't know what he was doing there. It was just a big tall black mass peeking out from behind the shed. It was massive. It was big. I jumped up and ran inside to get the gun. I was able to see its head, part of the shoulder and some of the knee. It was leaning out. It was seven foot tall, but it was sort of hunched over too. There is no lighting back there, only in the front of the house. We have a tree line that comes up behind our place. The tree line comes with about 100 feet of the house. I don't know how many times I've been here by myself and heard something bang on the shed in the back. There were a couple of nights that I went out there with my gun, but every time I've heard a bang like something is hitting on it and the door had been left open. I don't know if something was trying to get in there. I know it's not the door banging because the door is on a track to hold it still. There's been other times by the camper shell I've heard noises. I've run inside and get the big light and shine it over there, but nothing there. There are a lot of unusual noises that I've heard over the years here and there, and I've never been able to put to what it was. There are several times when I have walked back to check the noises at the shed where I felt something was watching me. I've also gotten that feeling a lot at my French doors because I don't have anything over them. I'll be sitting on my couch and feel like someone is looking through that window, and I'll look up and there's nothing there and when I get this feeling, I am home by myself. I have an apple orchard in the back, but of course, this time of year, there aren't any apples. But late last year, a lot of the apples were gone. My husband picks up all the bad ones and throws them out into the field. I got to thinking about this because somebody found a footprint recently between Bunker Hill and Staunton. I have recently moved out of my house in Illinois. During the last year or so, I have experienced several strange occurrences. I have never actually seen anything, except once a large dark shape moving bipedally through the heavy fog. I have heard the sound of something drumming on tree trunks, the sound of something big walking in the woods on two legs. I have found chunks of firewood thrown from my woodpile, and on November 25th of 2008, as I was packing to move, I heard a moaning howl very close to the house. I have hunted for 20 years, and I have never heard the likes of this. I stopped loading the vehicle, loaded my 45, and locked the door. I did the rest of my packing, and the next two nights, armed, but as before, I had the distinct feeling I was being watched, and several times large branches were broken, and there was knocking on trees. Also, there is an area of woods where the grass and foliage is crushed down. This could be deer, but since these things have started occurring, the deer, who are usually thick as fleas, have been gone. Several other people have heard knocking. However, I was alone when the howl occurred, and it is mostly at night. Back in the spring of 1978, at the age of 17, Myself and my high school sweetheart were parking just off of a seldom-traveled country road in a county about 10 to 13 miles south of Carlinville and roughly 10 miles west of Gilspie. We were making out on a farm field across in the back seat of my car, parked about 20 feet off the road. The area was fertile, bottom land, just about 50 feet from a bridge over a small creek. There were dense woods around with a small cornfield maybe four acres cut out of the fertile soil alongside of the creek. The night was one I'll never forget. In our young passion, a foul stench came over the area, 
but the real thrill soon followed. We heard the loudest, most shill scream we could imagine. It was very, very close and extremely loud. It started as several low-toned grunts and exploded into the most frightening shill scream I'd ever heard. It seemed to vibrate the old car we were in. We were both panic-stricken and scared out of our minds. I jumped into the front seat, butt naked, and drove like hell until we were on high ground and away from any woods. I hadn't taken time to dress until we were miles away from that spot. We discussed what had happened and decided to keep the whole thing a secret. Actually, we looked at each other and said something like, this didn't happen, did it? The whole thing gave me a fear of the woods that lasted for almost 20 years. But as I looked back on it, I realized whatever it was had been watching us, and at any time, if it were a savage beast, had every chance to do whatever it wanted to do to us. Did we go back later and look for the tracks? No. No way. I avoided that area at all cost, day or night. Did the sound resemble recordings that we hear of Bigfoot? Well, actually it did indeed, but amplified by a hundredfold. I recall as small children the screams of what the local Illinois farmers call the mountain lion. We had several cattle maimed, and that scream was nothing like the one we had heard that evening. It was just so chilling. My wife and I were driving home from Denver, Colorado to Albuquerque, New Mexico, and stopped at a gas station in Las Vegas, New Mexico. I believe it was Phillips 66 at approximately 100 on 10-18-2013. We pulled off of I-25 southbound into the gas station parking lot. When we were driving down from the frontage road towards the gas station, we saw a few vehicles on the far end of the parking lot with three to four people talking and a New Mexico state police officer cruiser was leaving the lot. However, upon parking in front of the gas station, we discovered that it was closed. I needed to pee rather urgently, so I ran around to the back of the station to find a dark place to do my business. I walked about 20 meters behind the gas station to be totally out of sight of the occupied vehicles in the gas station lot. As I was urinating, I began to feel uncomfortable. I was peeing in open ground and initially thought somebody was walking up behind me, probably to do the same thing. I craned to look around and saw nobody, no animals, just a blanket feeling that somebody was very near me. As I finished peeing, I turned and began briskly walking back towards our vehicle. As I was hurrying back, I turned to look behind me and this is when I became a believer. Before I continue, I would like to preface that my anecdote by alluding to my high level of academic credentials alongside my occupation as a healthcare executive. I also provide executive and technical advice to elected and appointed officials. I have worked very hard to become an expert based on empirical analysis and studied fact. I did not believe in Bigfoot, ghosts, or another unexplained anomalies. I believed in results, hard work, and well results. My perspective is now very different. As I turned and looked over my left shoulder, I saw an enormous lurking animal. The animal was crouched over, almost as if taking cover in the sparse and cold vegetation. In fact, I think the creature watched me the whole time and did not make such a noise. However, the creature noticed when I saw it. It stood up and quickly lumbered into the dark away from the direction of the parking lot. The one attribute of the creature that resounded with me was how heavy the footfall was. It sounded like somebody dropping a sack of potatoes over and over again, and it was fast. I observed the creature for about 11 seconds from the moment I realized I saw it to watching the animal dart into the wood line. Due to the radiant light from the parking lot, I can make steady detail of the fleeing creature. Here are the salient points from my memory, aside from the footfall. 
the creature was approximately 8 to 10 feet tall. I'm 6'2", and this animal would have towered over me, since I observed it on flat land leading to my estimation. The hair on the creature was matted, like dogs that live outside. The coloration was dark brown. The creature had a very defined gait. It took strides that I would estimate to be three to fourths of my stride per one of its strides. It had massive human-like hands. The creature was very skittish, not moving until realizing I was observing it, lending to a higher intellect than that of a brown bear. I believe the creature may have fled in fear. I did not make eye contact, but noticed a massive brown and defined jaw and cranial structure. There is one other trait that I have since read about that may allude to this being a New Mexico Bigfoot. The air was rank with what I thought was the dumpster behind the gas station. However, this might be the musk eyewitnesses have reported in the past. I cannot be sure, but it was very powerful, and somewhat reminiscent of what I perceived to be urine. This incident was fearful and moving. I was unable to sleep for days and could not bring myself to tell my wife until recently. Due to my profession and reputation, I have extreme, extreme reluctance about openly sharing my encounter. However, I have personal visual evidence of a so-called mythical beast, and I do not know what to do with it. Another fact, I have a concealed carry handgun license in the state of New Mexico, and was carrying a 1911 45 at the time of the incident. I was so scared that reaching for my weapon would have been an afterthought. I was actually scared stiff. I also noticed that the animal was trying to stay hidden and very cognizant of what I was and when I noticed it. It was Saturday, July 16th, 2011, about 12.30 a.m., early last Saturday morning. We were going to the Cheska Mountains on the Navajo Reservation for a family reunion. We just left the main paved highway through Narbana Pass, Indian Service Route 32, Highway 134, between Sheep Springs, New Mexico, and Crystal, New Mexico. We went south on a dirt road, Indian Service Route 32, into the Cheska Mountains. We were about five to eight miles into the mountains when we came upon a small hill that curved towards the east, then to the south. As we approached the hill to go up, the road quickly turned right or south. As we reached the top, we saw the full moon, and it lit up a flat green pasture that was on top of the hill. And as soon as we made the turn to the right, I noticed a big black figure standing there. As I looked at it, it stood with the full moon behind it, so that all I could see was a black outlined form. I kept my eyes on the figure while making the turn right. I said to my wife, did you see that? And she said, what? I said, something is standing over there by the road. As I looked, I noticed that the figure was standing by a small pond, which was about 10 to 15 feet from the road. I could see the figure's reflection in the pond, along with the full moon. I would say when I first saw it, it was about 75 feet away. As we got closer, our headlights turned to the right, away from the black figure. But I still could see it, because the moonlight was so bright. It just stood there, still, as if it was waiting for us to leave. I told her I was going to pull the truck onto the edge of the road, the road being dirt, and because of the rain, it had been plowed so there was a ridge of dirt on both sides of the road. So I pulled the vehicle, left towards the Bigfoot to flash my headlights on it. As my headlights flashed the Bigfoot, it turned. We could see the legs, which there were two of them, turn, and the arms, again, two of them turn, and it started running away from us up a small hill into the trees. It was a quick, smooth run. I mentioned to her that it ran ninja-like, smooth and stealthy. In less than six seconds, it was in the trees. As it was turning and running, we didn't see any clothing, buttons shining from the headlights or moonlights. We just saw a huge mass, a body running on two legs, and we never saw any eyes. 
We noticed the legs and arms, and for sure, it ran on two legs up the hill. We were about 30 feet away from it when it ran up the hill. We could see that it was not a bear, nor a human. It stood at least seven to eight feet tall. It was wider and taller than a person. After it ran away, we were in shock. We sat quietly in the truck, still for about 15 seconds. Then all of a sudden, my oldest daughter screamed and said, Daddy, what was that? I was shocked that she was awakened the whole time. I thought only my wife and I saw it, but she was terrified, asking me over and over. I couldn't say anything but tell her that it was a Bigfoot. My wife and I aren't crazy, nor are we believers of Bigfoot, until now. In fact, we were the biggest skeptics there are. But we can't deny what we saw. I have to believe it because it was real. My wife also admitted that she saw it too, as we first approached the hill, just like I did. She just wasn't sure at the time if it was the same thing that I saw. It was eerie and exciting at the same time. We also went back there on Sunday to look for tracks. There weren't any. The ground was extremely hard where it ran up the hill. Along the pond, we saw hoof prints from cows, dog prints, deer prints, but no noticeable Bigfoot prints of any kind. By the way, the pond was only about 10 to 15 feet wide. It was just runoff of rainwater, so it isn't always there during the year. It seemed to me that it was not wanting to be seen. I believe if I did not turn my headlights towards him, it would have probably stood there until we passed by. Then it would have left. I think it was very intelligent, because it watched us. And even before I can get the headlights turned on to him, he had already started to turn away from us. It had to have known what we were going to do next. That is probably why we didn't see any eyes. I have lots of stories from my grandmother about Bigfoot. She said they have been here since the beginning of time, and that they were like us, living among us, until they saw humans start to fight amongst themselves. Then, they didn't want any part of us anymore, so they went into hiding. They know that if they kill a human or make contact with one, they know that nothing good will come out of it. So, that is why they stay in hiding, after our encounter, we heard a lot more people have witnessed Bigfoot in the same area. We also observed that the Bigfoot noticed us on the hill. It seemed to me that it stood there until it noticed we were turning towards it, because it was already turning before our headlights shined on it. That is why we didn't see any eyes or any face. I've also heard other stories. Many more sightings have happened because of the fires in the Arizona mountains. I even talked to a Navajo Nation Ranger once, and he stated that a lot more deer elk and other animals have also migrated into the Cheska Mountains because of the fires. On Friday, March 12th, right around 6 p.m., I was going home from the store, and when I began to turn off the highway, I noticed something was waiting down on the side of the highway, near the creek, about 40 yards ahead of me. So at that time, instead of turning, I went on toward it to see what and if I was really seeing what I thought I was seeing. As I got within about 10 yards of it, it stood straight up, turned around slowly, and walked into the woods really calm. At the time, I couldn't believe what I just saw. The thing was very large, dirty white taller than the street sign that was near, and furry. I could tell it was not human or anything I'd ever seen before. It scared me so bad that I had tears in my eyes and began shaking at the time. Then, I went straight home and told my husband about it. My sister-in-law actually had seen something white stand up from behind the dog pen that was also whitish, looking back in the 90s. My husband's cousin seen something black squat down behind a tree about three miles to the woods from where I seen my sighting and there are also old tales that my husband has told me about something that people said he used to live in the old mines that is now a hunting club that was whitish looking and looked about seven to eight feet tall. They called it Bozo 
and he has heard several other people talk about seeing something similar within this area. Back in 1990, I was having predation problems on some property I was leasing at the time. Something was killing and eating my chickens that I was raising. So, me and my friend BJ decided to do a little varmint hunting. We set up in some tall sage grass in the field behind my home, about 300 meters away. It was late evening, and we got into position to do some calling with a fawn distress call that I had brought along with me. We called on and off for several minutes, no results. So, we decided to wait until just before dark to try again. We got to sitting there, just listening, noticed something was walking just inside the wood line, directly in front of us, maybe 150 meters away. It had the rhythm of something bipedal, not four-legged. We were upwind, so I waited to see what or who it was. It got so dark that couldn't see more than 25 to 30 meters, so we decided to call it quits for the day. When we got up, BJ shined his six-cell light at the woodline, and we caught a glimpse of something stepping back and stopped looking back where it had came. About then, we hears the same series of sounds, and the deer, rather than go back within 20 feet of us in the opposite direction, over the next few months, there were no more sounds, so we put it in the back of our minds and forgot about it. Deer season came, and we decided not to hunt the area alone, but to go ahead, and the same stench as that night, months before, and the closer we got to the place where the deer had been, it got worse. Upon arriving, the deer was gone. You could see it where it had lain, but it was nowhere to be found. There were no drag marks in the leaves, so whatever had moved it had actually lifted it from the ground and carried it. There are no known predators here larger than coyotes or bobcats. The deer weighed around 100 to 125 pounds, so whatever it was was large. This all occurred a mile and a half southeast of Alabama on a property owned by Mr. Gregg. This happened in 1988 in Novu, Alabama. I was 14 at the time. I was at home in my living room watching TV and my brother outside working on a car. We were the only ones at home. The front door was located in the living room. We never used this door because we had no steps to it and the door was about four feet from the ground. So we used the back door of the house. I was sitting on the couch, watching TV, when the door began to move, and the doorknob was turning. The only thing holding the door shut was a nail. Someone had nailed at the top of the wall and bent it over to hold the door shut. I first thought it was my brother, but he knew we didn't use the door. As the door was moving, just a little, I noticed at the bottom of the door, where there was a gap, Three fingers slide under the door. My heart began to beat faster. I tried to move, but I couldn't at first. Then, I wanted so bad to look out the window beside the door, but I was too scared. These fingers were very long, and the nails, too, were long and black. The hand-like finger had hair on it that was dark brown. The hair was also long. This only lasted for three minutes. When the fingers move out from the gap, the doorknob and both the door stop moving. About 45 minutes later, my brother came inside and I asked him why he was trying to use the front door, but he said he hadn't. I didn't tell him what happened until sometime later. Because of fear, he wouldn't believe me and the fear of him using this to scare me later on. I was canoeing on the Sipsi River here in Alabama. 
It was dusk as I was pulling out of the river, and I was trying to hurry, getting all my gear in the car before it got dark, as it was about a 60-yard walk up the steep hill to where my car was. Just as I was flipping the canoe up to put on my shoulders, I heard this very loud whoop, 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 then a pause, followed by three more whoops. I've been in the woods enough to know that it was not an owl, or like any sound that I've ever heard of, come to think of it. Too loud and far too powerful. It felt like it came from about a quarter to a half mile away. It scared me. You've never seen a guy hustle a 75-pound canoe on the shoulders and practically run up the hill. I didn't even tie it up on the property until I got up to the highway. The weird part was, I had been watching the Monster Quest series, and the month before had come down to the same river and thought, this area looks just like the stuff they used to show in the Pacific Northwest, where those Bigfoots are. Wonder if there were ever any Bigfoots in Alabama. So I did an internet search, and it surprised me to find out that the whole website is about Alabama Bigfoots. Those sounds I had heard sounded just like the whoops you have on the BFRO. Of course, after watching those shows, it could have been somebody doing that call. But I'd emailed the Alabama research people. They said they did not have anybody working that area at the time. And this was in August of 2010. Over the last year, I have had a few unusual moments in this area. No sightings, but, well, I'm short on time. The whoops were the important thing. Scared me to death. I live in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, in the Yellow Creek community. My husband and I heard screams in the woods from some kind of animal that is so loud, and it has a long guttural yell that sounds like a man. We have never heard anything like this. This has been going on now for three weeks in March of 2012. Almost every night, just about 8.30 p.m., or right before it getting dark. Then it stops for about a month. And now, it has started back up again. I have lived in the country all my life, and I am 52. My husband is 66 years old. We're not a bunch of kids making these things up. I know what cougars, coyotes, bears, and wolves all sound like. We have never heard anything like this in the woods before. Other than 14 years ago. My son, who is in the army, and still is to this day. He and I were sitting outside one night, right around 11 p.m., just talking. We heard the same thing yell out then. It came from behind my house and it yells out in that long guttural yell three times. And after the third time, it sounded like there was 50 or more coyotes were surrounding us, and they started yapping like crazy. The recent sounds are coming between my grandfather's old house and my home. It's about a half mile away. We have a huge lake behind us and nothing but woods. My grandfather has some old abandoned gravel pits and lakes close by too. There is a swamp in front of our home, about a quarter mile away. I was also told that when I was a child, back in the 1930s, my grandfather went through the gravel pit one night. He saw something sitting on the hill that looked like a huge hairy thing that had a face, just like a man. This, though, was before all the media hype from the Patterson films. I need help because this thing is getting closer to our home. My husband doesn't have good hearing, and he said he could hear it upstairs one night. It sounded like it was in the yard. We have animals, cattle and donkeys here. We don't know whether to shoot at the sounds from where it is coming from or what. On March 31st, 2012, it sounded like it was right down at the bottom of the holler, right past our fence. It sounded like two of whatever this thing is was mad and was yelling at us. I got so scared I took off running into the house. I've never been so frightened in my life. And believe me, 
When I say go outside a lot at night by myself, I really do. We have a huge wraparound porch, and I love to listen to the owls in the whirlpool at night. But nothing like this has ever happened to me before. Last week, I went to put my puppy up for the night in our garage. Then, I heard whatever this thing is, let out a scream. I called for my husband to come home, and it was back. When he got here, we heard it growl. It came from the same area as before. Like I said, before we heard it, just about every other night, for three and a half weeks. Then nothing. That night I told my husband, he's back. Then the next night, we heard it again. But this time, down in front of our house, down at the swamp. For the past two years, people have stripped cut thousands of acreage of land all around here, and a lot of animals have now migrated around here. My father did not have his timber cut, and he has a large amount of land, and we live in the middle of it. We have no one who lives by us, so I am emailed you in March. As you know, when you start talking about something they have never seen or heard, everybody thinks you're crazy. My husband and some others were preparing a field for planting when he noticed a pile of fecal matter in the field. He walked over to it and stated that he wondered what might have made such a large pile. As he looked around for horse or cow tracks, another person walked over to it and said, Look at the size of those footprints. They all began looking around and found tracks coming out of a grassy area onto a nearby dirt road. The tracks went about 20 feet, then turned sharply left into the freshly plowed field, plowed the day before. They proceeded about 30 feet into the field. There, you could tell where it paused to squat, repositioning its feet to do so, and did its business. While in this position, it dug up some turtle eggs in front of it and ate them, leaving broken shells behind. The feces were the consistency of horse droppings and the way they were high fiber content, contained undigested, a kind of wild grape. But the droppings weren't in the shape of a horse manure, round ball-shaped piles. They were long and cylindrical, like that of a dog or a human. The feces were about 18 to 24 inches long, and about two to two and a half inches across, rather large. The tracks then turned left again into an area of tall grass, small pines and other small trees that lined a field at the edge of the woods. I was not able to follow them very far due to dead branches, briars, and undergrowth that blocked my progress. Plus, I was wearing only sandals, shorts, and a tank top, not prepared to truck through the woods. I took pictures of the tracks and the feces with the yardstick for size comparison. I also took a specimen of the feces and turtle eggshells, which are still in my freezer. I have a cast of a left and right foot. The right one broke trying to pick it up, but is still in pretty good shape. The left one is completely intact. They measure approximately 18 inches long. 8 inches wide at the toes, and 4 and a half inches at the heels. The stride measured 3 feet from toe of one foot to the heel of the next step. Each foot is 5 toes. A human-like large toe on the inside of the step, and each toe following, being smaller than the last. There is an arch to both, showing it is not flat-footed. I took these samples to the University of Alabama, and show them to a professor who's an anthropology professor in forensics. I walked away disappointed to hear him insist that what I had were bear tracks, but he had been on a bear trip since I had spoken to him a few days prior about my finding. When I arrived at his office, before he even looked at the cast, he was talking bears and showing me books and pictures of bears and bear tracks. I tried to say bears don't have a big toe, but he tried to make up reasons that these tracks of a bear had a big toe. 
I realized this person was not going to believe what he was looking at. It either frightened him to think it was a possible Bigfoot out there, or he was embarrassed to say he didn't know what it was. Just a bear. Well, there's our encounter of a track sighting. And here's something else. My daughter used to drive through the area as a shortcut, but after seeing a very large figure on the side of the road at around 3 in the morning, now she goes the long way around after dark. She described it as being a hairy creature on two legs, in an upright stance, around 10 feet tall. She did not reveal this info until after the tracks were found, for fear that people would think she was crazy. Then, I read several sighting reports, and one dating back to 1999. I'm still bummed out that it was in the same general area. Freaky. And then, since the sighting of a man who lives in the area also claimed that something big picked up his chicken pen and carried it around 40 yards into the woods, and all of his chickens are gone. A man who grew up in this area stated he saw it as a child, but nobody would believe him back then. It was unusually warm to be mid-December on this day, and me and my buddy were hunting in an area known as Chiloe. It was about an hour before sunset when we climbed out of our deer stands. I met my buddy in a little holler, about 100 yards away from both of our tree stands. We were walking back to the four-wheeler when we heard a very low rumble in the holler that we had just met in. We were now at this time about 35 yards from the holler, almost in a field. So we thought we would be real still and sit on the edge of the field for a minute and see if we could hear anything else. At this time, we were thinking it was just a grunt or a blow from a deer that had scared. We waited probably 10 minutes before we heard a loud splash in a little drinking hole. Me and my buddy looked over at each other and said, what the hell is that? So we waited another minute, still hoping that a deer would come out. Then we heard a second splash. At this time, we realized it was not a deer. So we walked probably 20 yards and saw what we believe was to be a big hairy beast. It was approximately 8 feet tall and around 350 pounds. Me and my friend were almost in shock at what we had seen. This Bigfoot creature saw us and actually didn't even seem to care that we were watching it. It just kind of lingered there in the area for another minute before walking over a small ridge where we lost sight of it. And to be honest, he kind of just lingered there around the area for another minute before walking over a small ridge where we lost sight of it. And to be honest, we were too scared to go and look for it. So we went back to the house and told everybody there, but they said we were crazy and that it was just a bear. I've been hunting bear for years and I am familiar with their movements. This was no bear. I know this because it never dropped down on all fours of its feet the whole time we watched it and we probably saw it walk a total of 30 to 40 yards, but I am 100% certain that it was no bear. It was some sort of human ape creature. I am positive. So is my buddy. Back in the summer of 1995, myself and four friends were camping at the base of a mountain in our town in eastern Tennessee. Normal night with our friends until the campfire died down. We were on an old road bed and had been breaking all kinds of dead trees for fire. As we were doing this, a lost hunting dog came to us. When it did, we gave it some peanut butter and the poor starving thing ate and then carried off the plastic jar. We didn't think anything else of him until a few hours later. The fire began dying down and me and three of my friends were sitting, leaning against the embankment, as the dog came running back to us, shivering. Well, we were all kind of like, what the hell? I'm getting chills as I type this. We were looking in the direction where the dog came from, and we saw this large dark shadow just out of sight, and just out of the light, just out of our clear vision from the fire. Me and all my friends froze. The dog was whimpering, and that's not normal for a coon dog. 
we saw the shadow turn towards us, and we all saw the reflection of its eyes. It paused to look for all of us for 45 seconds, and then, like it was shot out of a cannon, this loud sound like it was running through the woods, breaking trees at this point. Fear had overwhelmed all of us. We had been in the area of woods many times over the years, built large fires as large as we could, and none of us slept the rest of that night. When we saw what we considered to be a Bigfoot, there was this terrible wet animal smell. It was unmistakable. To this day, I have never smelled an animal like it since. Approximately three to four years later, me and one of the guys were at the top of the mountain, not far from there, at a large natural sand cave and a large waterfall. We got bored as people do that age and went to the top of the sand cave to sit at the edge of the waterfall. As we climbed up to the top, we had that same smell hit us and that same type of destruction was present. Trees about 3.5 to 4 feet up were just broken off like the first time we ever encountered this. We looked around and followed the path as far as we could until it ran out. We all still talk about this to this day and we all get cold chills when we do. My wife was going to work around the end of July in 2002 and saw something by the side of the road. It was tall and dark colored. She slowed down because she thought it was somebody who might have broken down. The thing was at the edge of the road near a creek. As she stopped, it crossed the road and leapt onto a dirt bank about five to six feet off the road and went into the woods. A day or two later, as she was going to work, she saw something standing by the edge of the road in the same area. It was tall and dark with reddish eyes. It made no effort to come into the road and went back into the woods. All of these events occurred during the early morning hours on a remote section of mountainous road in Stony Creek section of Carter County on Highway 91. On August 1st, 2002, I was letting my dog out of the house because I thought he had to go to the bathroom. My female dog would not leave the house and my male dog went onto the porch and stared at a field adjacent to my house. This was three in the morning. He would not leave the porch and his ruff was up and he would growl really low. When I looked around and saw something in the field about two o'clock from my elevated position, I could not get a direct look at what it was, but it was large enough to be seen bent over in a field of nearly mature untopped tobacco. When it realized it was spotted, it made a chuffing noise between a growl and a guttural throat sound. At this time, I noticed another figure in the field moving off into a shadowy area between a barn and a road behind my location. This was a smaller version of what was in the field near me. The thing in the field, from me, stayed there until the thing that had crossed the road made a similar chuffing sound. The dogs behind my location and in the area where this was happened were barking. The thing in the field then began to move through the tobacco field to the tall grass and finally to the tree line. I also heard a noise like something in pain, something small. This was followed by two additional series of sounds coming from an area near the creek across the road from us. This was answered by the things that had crossed through the field at my location. The only thing I got a good look at was a rounded back covered with a brownish red or light brown fur. This again happened at night and the lighting was not bad. There was also partial moon and ambient light from the property nearby. I checked the area when I observed the things in the following morning and found areas of mashed up grass and trails that roughly followed the sounds I had heard the previous night. What was unusual was that I got the impression that there was a young animal of some kind hurt. It was a mewling sound that was kind of scared that I heard the area of the second thing. I did not find any footprints that could properly be identified. I did find depressions in the grass and trails through and the still wet grass where something had moved. I also was surprised that the things seemed to communicate with each other. 
one of the things that is not seen or seem to be angry or upset about something. Also, the things that did not cross the road but stayed in or around the creek seem to be looking for something. They even went so far as to climb or attempt to climb a tree. My wife and I noticed a tree by the creek moving and swaying as if somebody were climbing it. There was not enough wind to move the tree, and there was also a strong musty odor when the breeze changed and blew in our direction. August of 1984 When I was about 15, three of my friends and I were camping in the woods above my house. We had two dogs, a collie and a female husky. We had built a lean-to and to sleep under it. We were just talking about things, girls and such, when one of my friends let us know that he heard something. We just laughed at him. About two or three minutes later, two of my friends claimed to have heard the same noise as the two of us that did not hear it. So, we started making fun of them. About five minutes after that, our dogs began pacing back and forth, acting strange. Then, all at once, a loud yell came from behind the lean-to, and it shook hard. I could see it visibly shaking. We all ran, except for one, and he froze and could not move. We ran through the pitch-black woods, hitting trees and running through briars. When we got out of the woods, we turned and noticed that our friend was not with us. We yelled for him, and about two minutes later, he came out of the woods, carrying his collie in his arms. I never knew what that thing was, but my friend said that he could not see it, but that he could hear it behind him, making a grunting sound as he sat in front of the fire, and he could hear it behind him, walking as he walked out of the woods, some distance behind him. We went back the next day with an adult to retrieve our sleeping bags and things that our lean-to had been torn down. The rocks we had for the fire pit were scattered. The whole area smelt ten times worse than a wet dog. I am one of those police officers that people tell me I'm an overachiever. I can't help it if I feel like it's my duty to keep an eye out for trouble or problems, whether I'm in uniform or not. Emergencies and crises do not like to keep a schedule, so I feel like I should always have a sense about me, like I'm always on duty. But that's just me. One Sunday, when the wife and the kids were away, and I wasn't sure what to do with myself, I took the liberty of just going for a drive around the countryside. We live out in the rurals, because I don't think I could handle the noise and the chaos of my job, and the noise and the chaos of the city when I'm not at work. So, my home is my sanctuary to get away from all the kinds of noise and problems that city brings. While I was just cruising along, alone on an empty country road, you can imagine my surprise when I heard a car alarm. It was coming from some place you wouldn't expect a car alarm to come from. There was an expansive prairie grass off to the side where there were some woods far in the distance, and the car alarm is definitely coming from that direction. So, if somebody out there actually needed help, they were an awfully long way from finding it. So, my instinct to be available to anybody that might need help went out, and I put my car in park on the side of the road and went to go explore and investigate to see if somebody was in trouble. I may not hear. It could have been nothing. People trip off their own car alarms all the time. But if it was a real problem, a real emergency, they would need help. The prairie grass slowed my progression. And part of me was thinking that I didn't really need to be in a hurry, since the odds were against there being anything to worry about. That view was changed rather suddenly when I came across a heap, and I do mean a heap of bones, that towered clear up to a height, about three heads 
taller than me. They appeared to be mostly deer and similar animals. Something inside of me tried to make me stop looking at the pile before I could spot something like human bones. I didn't see any. Sorry. But coming across a bone collection like that was certainly odd. A bone collecting maniac would be an emergency indeed. So I progressed onward with a sort of determination to get to the bottom of whatever this was. The car alarm was beginning to be accompanied by loud crashes, as if the very vehicle that was in distress was being crushed or rammed. Of all the scenarios that ran through my head, none of them could prepare me for what I finally faced when I came upon the source of the commotion. A titan monster that I can only describe as Bigfoot was manhandling a car. It was picking it up and throwing it about, and the car alarm wailed in distress. My head was swimming, and I got dizzy with shock, anxiety, and disbelief. Seeing this monster was a mental blow in and of itself. Seeing what it was doing to a small car was another. As my senses leveled out, I noted that the creature didn't seem angry. It was trying to accomplish something. What, I could not tell. It continued flinging the car about until finally, the gasoline in the tank caught a spark in the commotion and erupted into a fireball. The Bigfoot or Sasquatch, whatever, gave every indication that this is what it had been waiting for. It took up a large tree branch and held it over the fire until it lit. Then, it took the flaming branch over to the pile of bones that I had first encountered, and it got the dry bones to catch flame, and it became a literal bonfire. I don't know that I had ever before seen such a picture of self-satisfaction than I had in that Bigfoot. That fire was at its proudest achievement at that moment. I was fascinated, but I was also still trembling. That was one situation that I hadn't been trained to handle. I tried getting footage on my phone, but I could not get a clear shot without giving myself away, and that was a definite no-no. I debated on calling the matter in and seeing if there was a body to look for. After all, if there was a car, there had to be a driver. But my fear and apprehension won that day. Several times I've looked back and wondered if I should have shot at this thing. As big as it was, I doubt that bullets would have done much. And besides, I hadn't really seen it hurt anybody. I didn't see any human remains in its tiny little campsite. If this story makes it to broadcast, has anybody else out there seen these creatures use fire? If you live in the city, you have no idea how good you've got it with the paved roads that are just outside your door. My story happened for the simple fact that I'm the guy that has to deliver mail and packages to the most remote parts of territory in Arkansas. There are some places where you wonder just how anybody gets in or out, let alone by mail, but they do, and it's very often thanks to me. Now, these isolated pockets are full of stories. Many of them are known only to the people that have experienced them, and furthermore, they are chock full of dark secrets that will never see the light of day. I was maneuvering my truck out in one of those areas where there isn't a paved road for miles and miles. Everything is dirt and gravel paths, memorized landmarks. People are very much alone with their thoughts and in their own little world in those parts. So that by the time there's an actual problem, by the time the word gets out there that there's an emergency, it's far too late. I had a taste of that 
when I was delivering some feed to a farm and was having a dickens of a time with it, just because of the mud. I was fishtailing really bad, no matter how I went about driving, because if I went too slow, I'd get stuck. I was forced to come to a complete stop, or else I'd hit the overturned cattle truck that was at a junction of dirt roads. It was the type that had room for maybe three cows if they were skinny enough, or two horses. I came out to this particular pocket of nowhere often enough to know a few names, but I did not recognize the truck or who it could possibly belong to. Looking in the truck didn't help much. No driver, no animals, and no hints as to where they could be. What I did notice is that the seatbelt looked like it had been torn off its anchor. Couldn't have been from any impact, since the truck was mostly okay. I knew that sometimes you had to cut the seatbelt if you were stuck. But this, you can tell it was very much torn. While I was scratching my head over the whole thing, I heard a really bad cry, or wail, come from somewhere past the trees that hemmed in on the junction. I was no ambulance, but if I didn't look into whatever was making that holler, they might not get any help of any kind for a very long time. So, I steeled my nerves and went to see what was making the ruckus. That was the second time that I was forced to come to a complete halt. But it wasn't because of any obstacle in the path. Strewn about, all over the ground, were body parts of several cows. Legs, bones, ribs, all still with fresh meat attached. Either they had been blown up or torn up, but I couldn't think of what could do that other than a chainsaw. I could feel my heart in my mouth, and I was seriously beginning to question the wisdom of investigating any further. The decision was made for me when I heard more hollering. That time, it sounded human. I decided to proceed with caution. Look before making myself known. I crept my truck at the path and stopped at the top of a hill. Looking down, I saw a burning heap of garbage. Nothing unusual around parts where there's no public garbage collection. What was downright unearthly, though, was the sight of some giant monkey thing. And I mean, this sucker was huge. And it had a hold of a portly man, gripping the poor guy by one leg. The man was struggling for all he was worth to free himself from the giant animal's paw, but he was locked in like a vice. The monster began slowly peeling off his clothes as if it was peeling an orange. That flannel shirt must have been really well made because it wasn't coming off without ripping off the man's right arm along with it. And the monster had no qualms with doing just that. The way that man bellowed in agony still comes back to me when I'm trying to sleep. The creature seemed fascinated by the way the arm popped off with a meaty sound. So it began pulling off the other man's limbs with the sociopathic fascination of a scientist performing a vivisection. The man's scream started to sound more animal than anything else and a hopelessness began to settle into my own chest. Since I knew that if he was being torn apart like that, there was no way an ambulance would be able to get out here in time to save him. He was a goner. After losing just one limb for sure, he would be gradually losing all of them. This thing flung the man aside like a child that was done pulling the wings out of a helpless insect. It turned its attention to a nearby heap of maimed cattle that were in the same shape the man was. Apparently, humans aren't appetizing, just fun to torture. I was hoping that Sasquatch was going to take his dinner elsewhere, but he never did. He stayed nearby the poor guy until there was no point in trying to hold out to save him. It felt like it took forever for me to get out there, 
since I had to move quietly. Getting caught on that occasion wouldn't get me a quick and painless death. And looking back, it really gets me how the most horrifying aspect of the experience wasn't seeing the monster. I've heard reports where the mere sight of this thing is enough to make people quake in their boots. No, for me, the worst of it was the screams of that poor man that the monster was toying with. It wasn't the least bit phased by his screaming. You would have thought it was deaf. The second most horrifying thing of all is that the guilt that I feel for not being able to save him. I know that it was one of those situations beyond anybody's control. But I can tell you that God made us to help one another. And to fail in doing that is to go against the way you're made. And it hurts. It hurts really bad. It's like failing to find a partner in life or failing to provide food and shelter for your kids. It leaves you feeling empty, cheap, and unworthy. But you don't care about my mental crisis. Y'all care about monster stories. So there's mine. If any of you out there see one, don't trust them. Just because they don't care for human meat, don't mean they won't hurt you 